Today, the origin of life remains one of natural science's biggest challenges. At this point, evolutionists have so little to offer by way of theories to explain how life originated all on its own through purely natural processes that most of them avoid the subject altogether. And many will claim that the origin of life is not even part of evolution, which is, is really just ridiculous. It is a necessary fundamental for natural science. And without it, evolution simply should not be taught as anything more than a hypothetical, not as a theory and certainly not as a fact like it's being taught in our public schools. If they can't explain how life originated, how that first cell started, they simply should not be teaching their theory, this theory, um, as a fact, the way they do today. Well, from the time of the ancient Greeks, it was believed by natural philosophers and scientists that some life forms would spontaneously arise from non-living matter. Aristotle himself wrote a book in 350 BC titled The History of Animals, where he talks about spontaneous generation as a way that some species originated from previous living tissues, such as when maggots would just suddenly appear on rotting meat. They assumed these maggots had come from that rotting meat. Well, in, in 1668, Francesco Redi, an Italian physician, challenged spontaneous generation in an experiment where meat was set out in containers, some open to the air, some sealed completely, and others covered with gauze. Well, as he expected, the maggots only appeared in the open flask in which the flies could reach the meat and lay their eggs. But despite his experiment, the belief in spontaneous generation remained strong, and even Reddy continued to believe that it occurred under certain circumstances. The invention of the microscope only served to further this belief in spontaneous generation. Microscopy, or the obs observing things under a microscope, revealed a whole new world of organisms that appeared to arise spontaneously. It was quickly learned that to create these animacules, as they were called, all a person had to do was take a handful of hay and stick it in some water and leave it for a couple of weeks. Come back and check it under a microscope and you find all kinds of single-cell organisms that just suddenly popped into existence, or so it seemed. Well, in 1859, the theory of spontaneous generation was finally laid to rest by Louis Pasteur, shown here. Coincidentally, it was the exact same year Darwin first published his book, On the Origin of Species. Well, well uh, Louis Pasteur was a devout Catholic and a creationist who is known as the father of microbiology. I give a quote here just to verify his beliefs in Christianity. He said, happy the man who bears within him a divinity, an idea of beauty and obeys it, an idea of art and an idea of science, an idea of country and an idea of the virtues of the gospel. Well, Louis, I want to tell you a little more about who Louis Pasteur was. His, his discovery, one of his main discoveries, was that most infectious diseases are caused by germs, known as the germ theory, which was one of the most important discoveries in all of medical history made by Louis Pasteur. He also discovered three disease-causing microorganisms. He discovered Staphylococcus, which causes staph infections. He discovered Streptococcus, which causes strep throat. And he discovered Pneumococcus, which causes pneumonia. He also developed vaccines against many of our diseases, such as cholera, anthrax, and, and rabies. The vaccines were all developed by Louis Pasteur. Well, the experiment that he conducted, which conclusively disproved spontaneous generation, finally, was conducted as part of a contest that was put on by the French Academies of Science. They sponsored a contest for the best experiment to either prove or disprove spontaneous generation conclusively. Well, in, past, in, in Pasteur's award-winning experiment, what he did was boil meat broth in the flask that you see here, a flask that was open to the air, but he bent the neck of the flask so that nothing could get into the meat broth from the outside. Well, as Pasteur expected, no microorganisms grew in the flask, even after several days. But then he tipped the flask so that the meat broth was able to get up into the neck of the flask and flow back into it. And within a day or two, it became cloudy and full of microorganisms. 
So not only had he conclusively refuted the theory of spontaneous generation, but he also convincingly demonstrated that microorganisms are everywhere, even in the air. But despite the global acclaim of Pasteur's award-winning experiment, evolutionists have continued to uphold the belief. Charles Darwin himself still advocated for spontaneous generation more than 15 years later. In a letter written in 1871 to a uh, friend by the name of uh, Joseph Hooker, Darwin said, It is often said that all the conditions for the first production of a living organism are present, which could ever have been present, but if, and oh what a big if, his words, we could conceive in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity, etc. were present, that a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes. At the present day, such matter would be instantly devoured or absorbed, which would not have been the case before living, or, or living creatures formed. So Charles Darwin himself continued to advocate for spontaneous generation close 15 years later. And almost 20 years after Pasteur's experiment, Ernst Haeckel, one of Darwin's most evangelistic promoters in Europe, continued to advocate for its belief on purely religious grounds. In 1876, he stated, If we do not accept the hypothesis of spontaneous generation, then at this one point in the history of evolution, we must have recourse to the miracle of supernatural creation. Haeckel continued to choose spontaneous generation because he did not like the alternative, a belief in God. Then in 1883, 24 years after Pasteur's experiment disproving spontaneous generation, Ernst Haeckel committed an act of fraud to prove that life had arisen spontaneously. He claimed to have discovered primitive cells he called monerans and described them as being not composed of any organs at all, but consist entirely of shapeless, simple, homogeneous matter. He said, they're nothing more than a shapeless, mobile lump of mucus or slime, consisting of albuminous combinations of carbon. But where did Haeckel see these cells he described as simple little lumps of mucus or slime? Only in his imagination. They are a requirement for the theory of evolution, but not something that has ever been observed. However, this did not stop him from making more than 30 drawings of these imaginary creatures that he named Monerans, which along with 73 pages of speculations were published in a prestigious scientific journal in Germany in 1868. He also gave them scientific names like Proto-Amoeba Primitivia, because a primitive Proto-Amoeba must have existed before the complex amoebas we have today. So I guess why not just go ahead and make it up? until it's discovered, that is. The, but the extent of his fraud is really revealed here when you consider the detail in the drawings that he made. Look at the detail of this drawing for an organism that had not a shred of evidence for its existence. And this, given the fact that uh, Ernst Haeckel worked at Jena University in Germany, which was the home of some of the finest optical equipment available to its day. Ernst Haeckel knew well microscopy and was very skilled at it. In fact, Ernst Haeckel published on diatoms, which better illustrates the height of his deception. He made accurate, detailed drawings of other microorganisms like the diatoms shown here. Uh, diatoms are single cell algae that are enclosed within a cell wall made of silica, which have these beautiful geometric, symmetrical forms. Hardly the shapeless little lumps of mucus or slime, like uh, Ernst Haeckel had described those monerans. Shown here are a couple of the plates of diatoms that Ernst Haeckel published in a book that he uh, titled Art Forms in Nature. Art Forms in Nature. Again, Haeckel had access to some of the most advanced optical equipment available in his day, and his work shows that he was well aware of the complexity of cellular forms. These single-cell organisms that you see here are far from shapeless, simple, homogeneous lumps of mucus. And isn't it amazing that someone can see art forms in nature and not recognize that there's an artist behind it? Evolutionists recognize design, but won't admit to there being a designer. 
They, they, they refer to engineering in the biological world, but don't describe an engineer as being behind it. Well, the Monerons that Haeckel imagined did not then, nor do they now exist. The actual organisms, however, that were later assigned to, this ta- to that named taxa, Monerons, were later discovered to be in possession of the most complex molecular machine we know of, the flagellum. When I was in college, we learned the bacterial kingdom as the, as the kingdom Monera, which, is, uh, which was later re- reassigned to Archaebacteria and Eubacteria, but it was the bacteria that were given the name Monera, ori- that was originally uh, assigned by Ernst Haeckel, and yet these bacteria are in possession of one of the most complex molecular machines we know of. They are far from simple organisms. Well, spontaneous generation theories were and are today something that has almost zero direct supporting evidence. The view has been upheld from the beginning by purely philosophical or religious reasons. Franklin Harold is a professor of microbiology at the University of Washington and states this unequivocally in his book, The Way of the Cell. He says, life arose here on earth from inanimate matter by some kind of evolutionary process about four billion years ago. This is not a statement of a demonstrable fact, but an assumption almost universally shared by specialists as well as scientists in general. It is not supported by any direct evidence, nor is it likely to be, but it is consistent with the evidence we do have. But, ladies and gentlemen, the only evidence is that life exists. And because because evolutionists believe there is no God, it must have evolved spontaneously. Klaus Dos is the director of the Institute of Bio, for Biochemistry at Johannes Gutenberg University in West Germany and is considered one of the foremost experts in the area of molecular evolution. He said, more than 30 years of experimentation on the origin of life in the fields of, fields of chemical and molecular evolution have led to a better perception of the immensity of the problem of the origin of life on Earth rather than to its solution. At present, all discussions on principal theories and experiments in the field either end in stalemate or in a confession of ignorance. George Wald was awarded the 1967 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for discoveries concerning the visual processes in the eye, and he openly admitted to the belief in the impossible that life arose spontaneously because he cannot accept supernatural creation. He said, when it comes to the origin of life, there is only two possibilities, creation or spontaneous generation. There is no third way. Spontaneous generation was disproved 100 years ago by Louis Pasteur, but that leads us to only one other conclusion, that of supernatural creation. We cannot accept that on philosophical grounds. Therefore, we choose to believe the impossible, that life arose spontaneously by chance. That's where evolutionists stand today, and that's a fact. Well, what we have learned is that the cell is tremendously complex, much more complex than Darwin and his contemporaries knew, and it became increasingly more complex with each new discovery. Well, drawing an analogy to express the complexity of the cell is difficult because there's really nothing in all of human experience that compares to the complexity we see in the cell. Our marvels, marbles of modern technology, like a Boeing 747, pale in comparison. The cell has orders of magnitudes more moving parts than a Boeing 747. In fact, a Boeing factory full of Boeing 747s doesn't come close. Uh, The only thing that you could really even draw a reasonable comparison to would be a city. That the cell is as complex as an entire city. There's really nothing else we can compare it to. It is truly unparalleled in its complexity, in human experience at least. There is nothing on earth that can serve as an adequate comparison for the complexity we have found. It has countless molecular machines, We call many of these enzymes. Factories full of machine, in fact. Factories we call organelles. It has a central library of information and a system to distribute that information. It has an infrastructure that you you see here that's called the cytoskeleton. And in, in fact, it has highways that assemble and disassemble, much like the cytoskeleton, highways that can just self-assemble, and armies of delivery vehicles moving manufactured goods from one place to another. 
The cell is truly unparalleled in its complexity and design. But despite this knowledge, origin of life theories typically invoke chance and necessity, the natural laws of molecular interaction, or a combination of these. And although the first cell is thought to have been very, a very primitive ancestor of our present cells that are alive today, experts agree that the living, a living cell must be able to do at least these three things. So in any primitive cell must at least be able to do these three things. Store information. Today, information is stored in the form of uh, a gen a genetic information stored in the form of DNA or RNA. Process energy. That is either make energy by capturing uh, energy from like sun or breaking down molecules to get energy from them and be able to reproduce. It must be able to do all of these things. And that requires a lot of stuff to be able to do this. Well, the origin of life is believed to have occurred uh, at this point about 3.9 billion years ago. The origin of life keeps getting pushed further and further and further and further back in time because we keep finding bacteria in the deepest and deepest and deepest rocks on earth. So the origin of life just keeps getting pushed further and further back. The earth is believed to be 4.6 billion years old. And the origin of life at this point has been pushed all the way back to 3.9. But they believe it only occurred once. And in the 3.9 billion years since has never occurred again. They believe all life on earth has descended from one ancestral cell. They call the last universal ancestor. And all life on earth has descended from that one ancestral cell. Well, I want to walk you through the steps on the origin of life. What steps must have occurred in which order? And, and in a way, show you some of the supporting evidence for some of these steps. Okay, the first molecular building blocks would have to form, like in a primordial soup, like a Darwin envision. Uh, the, the building blocks for the big macromolecules would have to form first. Those are things like amino acids, which are the building blocks for proteins, or nucleotides, which are the building block for nucleic acids. First, we have to get the building blocks to form. And after you get the building blocks, then you could consider the, that the, the development of the big macromolecules, most of which are polymers. So amino acids are the mon monomers that make up these long chains that we call po a protein, which is a polymer. Nucleic acids are long polymers. Most of your carbohydrates and lipids are these big, long polymers. These would have had to form next. These, building these uh, macromolecules then would eventually aggregate together to form that first cell, which most believe was probably a bacteria, it is assumed that it might have been a chemotroph, a bacteria that's able to eat chemicals and use those for energy. Uh, the bacteria you see here on the screen is uh, actually the bacteria that causes salmonella, uh, not a chemotrophic bacteria, but just one for example. <clears throat> then the origin of the, the organelles must be explained. There's two general kinds of cells on earth, bacteria and all the others. Plants and animals, protist and, and fungi, all have a type of cell called a eukaryote that has compartmentalized functions called organelles, like the mitochondria is an organelle, the chloroplast is an organelle. Well, it is generally believed that, you know, that, that these organelles came through a process called endosymbiosis, that one bacteria ate another bacteria, and instead of digesting that bacteria, it lived inside of the other one and became an organelle. They believe that mitochondria came about by an endosymbiotic process. That was actually a bacteria in the beginning and became an organelle. The chloroplast is similarly speaking. And we can act, this is actually happens. Symbiosis like this does occur. The uh, video that I was showing you is of a, uh, a type of protist that will eat algae and instead of digesting the algae, the algae is allowed to live inside of it. And the, the single cell organism you see here benefits from the products of photosynthesis and uh, the algae gets them a little safe home as well. But many organisms do this. Your, your um, anemones and, your, and many of your jellyfish in, in, engage in endosymbiotic uh, relationships like this too, which is why your anemones live in very shallow depths because they're benefiting from internalized algae in the same way. So endosymbiosis is a thing, we can, but they point to that as a possible route through which the organelles came from. Well, then you have to explain multicellular organisms. 
So they claim that a, a multicellular organism developed through a colonial process. We can find some organisms, uh, colonial organisms, that live for a period of time as single cell organisms that will then aggregate into a colony. This is the slime mold. The video I'm showing you here is of a slime mold. Those are individual slime mold cells that are aggregating together to form what's called a slug. You see the little thing crawling across here? This is a mass of single cell organisms that are now moving together as a, as a, like a little miniature slug. I mean, that's pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. Well, but it should be pointed out that multicellular organisms are far from aggregates of single cell organisms. They are made up of many different specialized cells. For example, muscle cells or nerve cells or the sensory cells. Multicellular organisms are made of not just its specialized cells, but specialized tissues. The organs in the human body are all made up of multiple different kinds of tissues that are made by specialized cells. You have epithelial tissue and muscular tissue and nerve tissue and connective tissue that, are made up, uh, that, that make up the various organs in the body. So this is a, a level of complexity of cellular organization that evolutionists cannot at this point explain. Well, <clears throat> these are the general steps that I, I explained to you here as, as to how the first cell is thought to originate. Well, when I was a, I just want to point out a quick story real quick. When I was a, a graduate student at Texas Tech, uh, my major professor at the time found out that I, I believed in creation. And uh, he told me I had to take evolution. So even though I was a graduate student in molecular biology, I had to take a, the, an evolution class out of the zoology department because, uh, you know, he, he thought it would convince me. And well, after I'd finished the, the, taking the class on evolution, he, we, he asked me later if I now believed in evolution. And I told him, no, you know, I still don't believe in evolution. And he, he asked me, he says, well, what about endosymbiosis? Hasn't that proven evolution? And, uh, but I'm going to, Look in this sequence of steps to find where endosymbiosis is. It's like the fourth step down. First, you have to get the building blocks, and then you have to get the macromolecules to form, your proteins and nucleic acids. Somehow, you got to get those to form spontaneously, and then you got to get that first cell to form. Well, he was talking about endosymbiosis, which is how the, uh, a eukaryotic cell would form, how those organelles of eukaryotic cells were formed. He, to him, to my major professor, endosymbiosis was substantial proof of the origin of life, that the origin of life had happened through purely natural processes. But what about these other steps? I mean, we're skipping a few big steps by just looking at endosymbiosis and thinking that's proof of the origin of life because it's far from that. Well, let me, let's look at some of these others. What about the origin of those building blocks and those big macromolecules? Um, one of the most difficult ones for them to explain is information. One of the most remarkable discoveries of our generation is that information governs the biological world. Biological information exists in cells of all organisms as this complex molecule we call DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid. This molecule, this DNA molecule, carries complex coded instructions for the assembly and use of proteins in cells. And proteins are the machinery and the material that make life possible. Proteins do everything, and in most cases, they are everything. They are the machines that make everything in the cell. They do all the work that's in, in, done in cells. And, and for many, they're also the building blocks. Now, for example, your hair and your fingernails are made of pure protein. But there's a protein machine that was making those structures, okay? Okay. And everyone acknowledges that DNA is information. This is not a contested assertion. Even Bill Gates said that, uh, that uh, the gene is by far the most sophisticated program around. Everyone understands that DNA is information. Well, the fact that DNA is coded information causes it to stand as the single most powerful argument for intelligent design that exists. Because in all human experience, information invariably originates from an intelligent source, from a mind or personal agent. Well, so when it was discovered that information governed the biological world, it should have led to the conclusion, or at least the suggestion, that that DNA was also the result of an intelligent mind. Because that's how, is how science is supposed to work. You're supposed to use your past experience and knowledge to inform your conclusions. 
In all past human experience and knowledge, information comes from only one source, an intelligent mind. When we discovered information in cells, it should have led to the conclusion, or the theory at least, that that information might have also come from an intelligent source. Well, since intelligence is the only known cause of specified information, the presence of such information-bearing sequences in biological systems should point definitively to the existence of a designing intelligence behind life on Earth. Well, the amount of information in a human cell is mind-boggling. And to illustrate this, let me point out what that genetic information is. Well, the, the DNA molecule is that helical structure that's spinning there in the, on this slide. It's shaped like a ladder that's twisted, and so it's called a double helix. Well, each step or rung along that ladder is made up of one of four possible molecules that are abbreviated with the letters A, C, T, and G. They stand for adenosine triphosphate, cytosine triphosphate, guanidine triphosphate, thymidine triphosphate, abbreviated with the letters A, C, T, and G. Well, the, the diagram that's on the, on, on, on the slide is actually a DNA sequencing gel. And I ran many, many DNA sequencing gels when I was a technician at Texas Tech, mostly helping uh, PhD students with their work. But what you see next to it is sequencing data. That all of those A, T, Cs, and Gs, that's what DNA sequencing data looks like when they're sequencing the human genome. That's what they, that's what they generate. Well, if every A, T, C, and G of the gene is, is taken to be equivalent to the letters in our alphabet, then the amount of information in one human cell is approximately equivalent to a thousand books. So there's a thousand letters. If those A, T, C's, and G's are equivalent to the letters in our alphabet, then that's how many letters there are in, the hu in one human cell is equivalent to a thousand books. Or to put it another way, a little pinhead size pile of DNA a pile of DNA, the, two millimeters in size, the size of a pinhead, has as much information as there are in 500 stacks of books reaching the moon or a single stack of books 93 million miles high. That's how much information there is in DNA. It's an incred incredibly compressed information system. And where do evolutionists believe all of this information came from? Well, random natural processes. They invoke mutations that when copying the DNA strand, errors were introduced. When exposing the DNA to foreign mutagens like UV bombardment, mutations are introduced. They literally suggest that that, that original DNA sequence, by randomly changing that original DNA sequence, they, you came up with more DNA sequences. That the difference between us and a bacteria is simply due to random changes to information. But, ladies and gentlemen, this assertion by evolutionists stands as the most ludicrous aspect of the theory of evolution. It is an affront to common sense, it's an affront to logic, and it's an affront to reason to suggest that you can randomly change letters in a book and get a, a new book. To randomly change letters in a book and get a library of books is what they are suggesting, and it is ludicrous. But I want to be a little bit honest here, okay? Um, is it possible, you know, uh, is it conceivably possible that on rare occasion a mutation could produce some new trait? A trait that would provide an adaptive advantage? A trait that might perhaps allow an organism to transcend beyond its former plane of existence to some ever higher plane in the cosmos? You know, is it possible? That mutations could accomplish such a thing? No. This is science fiction. It's science fiction. Mutations don't, improve, don't create improvements to organisms. They destroy them. Mutations destroy information. You randomly change letters in a book, you're going to destroy your book, and everyone knows this to be the case. It's science fiction, and only science fiction that could propose something different. But I'll mention, we, we had talked about this, that I, as a big fan of sci-fis, and I love all the sci-fi shows, you know, I can point to X-Men or Heroes or whatever. It's interesting that from all the sci-fis, it's like we cannot imagine an improvement to our present form. Because all of the advancements from mutations, all the mutants in these sci-fi shows have supernatural abilities. 
They call them abilities. or They, they all give them supernatural abilities, not physical abilities. It's, it's like we can't imagine an improvement to our present physical form. We can only imagine some supernatural elevation in our present form. I find it interesting. Well, despite the overwhelming evidence of design that is in biological systems, a scientist uh, that is committed to naturalism must refuse to acknowledge the obvious implications of these observations, that the world was created. Francis Crick, shown here, was the co-discoverer of the DNA helix, who won the Nobel Prize in 1962 for discovering the shape of the DNA helix. <clears throat> well, he admits to seeing evidence of design but states that biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not design, but rather evolved. They refuse to accept the witness of their own eyes. There's art in the world, and so there's an artist behind it. There's design in the world, means there's a designer behind it. God has created the world with abundant evidence that it was created. But why can these natural scientists not see the truth? Paul speaks to this in Romans. He says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they knew the creator God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks for the creation, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Well, that is the nature of science today. They simply refuse to acknowledge the truth of what they see. Well, in addition to the origin of genetic information, evolutionists also have to account for the origin of proteins, because these both had to form spontaneously to get a living system going. Well, in The Origin of Species, Darwin said this, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down, but I can find out no such case. Well, again, they didn't know anything much about the cell in Darwin's day. Today, we know that the cell is chocked full of molecular machines. Molecular machines like the kinesin shown here, that these such machines abound in the city we would call the cell. The kinesin is a nanoscale micro robot carrying a vesicle of manufactured goods down a, a microtubule highway there. Machines like the kinesin are what we describe as irreducibly complex and simply cannot be built by numerous successive slight modifications. In his book, Darwin's Black Box, Michael Behe describes irreducibly complexity like this, which can be used to test for something as being intelligently designed or not. He says an irreducibly complex system is a single system which is composed of several interacting parts that contribute to the basic function and where the removal of any one of those parts would cause the system to effectively cease functioning. He uses as an, as an example the mousetrap. Because there's a lot of machines in the cells that, in cells that are much more complex than a basic little mouse trap like this. But he uses the mouse trap because it's the simplest machine we know of, really. But Darwinists have to explain the origin of machines like this through numerous successive slight modifications over countless generations. But a machine, a mouse trap doesn't work when you only have the base plate of the mouse trap. It's not going to work. And but then. Evolutionists will, will, uh, will argue that maybe a few generations later, a random mutation would happen that would give the cell the ability to make the spring. And now the cell has the base plate for its mousetrap and the spring for its mousetrap. Mousetrap still doesn't work. And then generation after generation after generation after generation, it keeps making that stuff, though it does, has no use for it. And eventually a mutation happens that gives it the ability to make the tr triggering mechanism or whatever. Darwinian mechanisms cannot explain the development of a machine like this that has multiple interacting parts that all have to be there for the machine to function. Such things cannot be developed through numerous successive slight modifications. They have to be assembled as an integrated whole. Michael Behe continues, an irreducibly complex system cannot be produced gradually by slight successive modifications of a precursor system since any precursor to an irreducibly complex system is by definition non-functional. 
and the molecular, machine, molecular machines like the kinesin, I will show you others, abound within the cell. Well, the most famous experiment that was conducted to solve the mystery of the origin of life was conducted in the 1950s by a graduate student named Stanley Miller and his professor, Harold Urey. They sought to demonstrate that the building blocks of proteins, amino acids, could form under natural conditions by creating a reproduction of a theoretical atmosphere of the early Earth, including its water cycle. So the apparatus shown here was equipped with several things. It was equipped with a port on the side where they could introduce materials into this reaction vessel. They added methane as a carbon source. They added ammonia as a nitrogen source. They added some hydrogen gas and the water vapor there to complete the water cycle. A chamber was added to add some lightning strikes, some electricity to get some some energy added to those molecules to get them interacting with one another. They added a condenser because condensation reactions promote uh, uh, co one condensation, uh, condensation reactions are one of the main types of reactions that uh, bond uh, some atoms together or some molecules together. They also added a collection chamber down at the bottom of the apparatus to collect what they had isolated. And from this, they did manage to isolate four amino acids. 2% uh, of the solution that they uh, extracted from this was amino acids, but it was mostly toxic sludge. However, there were several substantial problems with the Miller-Urey experiment that, that are rarely noted by advocates of spontaneous generation. Again, they were supposed to be creating a model of the Earth's early atmosphere. But there was one main component of our atmosphere that was intentionally excluded from this experiment. Look what they added. They added methane, and they added ammonia, and they added hydrogen gas, and they added some water vapor. But what is obviously missing from this atmosphere? Oxygen. They included no oxygen intentionally, not even carbon dioxide, which has oxygen, intentionally excluded both of those. And the reason is that oxygen is itself a poisonous gas that oxidizes, meaning removes electrons from other molecules. Every good biochemist knows that amino acids will not form in the presence of oxygen. And if you have amino acids, oxygen will destroy them through oxidation. Everyone knows this. Notice that they didn't even include carbon dioxide, though, which is the carbon source for all life today. Plants make carbohydrates getting, using carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, not methane, but they intentionally excluded oxygen, intentionally excluded carbon dioxide for this reason. There was an early assumption by origin of life theorists that the Earth's early atmosphere had no oxygen and was instead what they call a reducing atmosphere. However, this was conclusively shown to be wrong back in the 1980s. This assumption was shown to be wrong back in the 1980s. That, again, that the Earth's atmosphere was ever reducing. They found this due, they know this due to the presence of oxide minerals in even the deepest of Earth's rocks. From the Bulletin of American Meteorological Society in 1982, geologists know from their analysis of the oldest known rocks that the oxygen level of the early atmosphere had to be much higher than previously calculated. From the Journal of Geology, 1982, there is no scientific proof that the Earth ever had a non-oxygen atmosphere such as evolutionists require. Earth's oldest rocks contain evidence of being formed in an oxygen atmosphere. Earth seems to have always had an oxygen atmosphere, completely discrediting these early theories uh, put, by, uh, put forth by evolutionists, again, that still hold to the notion of spontaneous generation. Well, despite this massive fundamental problem with the Miller-Urey experiment, the results of this experiment continue to appear in literally every biology textbook today that talks about evolution. Whenever they're, if you ever have a whole chapter about evolution in a biology book, invariably in that chapter, they will talk about the origin of life. And in their discussion on the origin of life, they mention this stupid Miller and Urey experiment. You'll find it in, literally, try to find a biology textbook that doesn't have one. This, is, this quote is from uh, Prentice Hall Biology, which is arguably the most widely used biology textbook used in U.S. public schools. 
they summarize the significance of the Miller-Urey experiment this way. Over a few days, several amino acids, the building blocks of proteins, began to accumulate. Miller and Urey's experiments suggested how mixtures of organic compounds necessary for life could have arisen from simpler compounds present on the primitive earth. But this is simply not true. The experiment did not produce anything resembling mixtures of organic compounds necessary for life. A racemic mixture of molecules was obtained. But it is well-known fact that the majority of the really important organic molecules required by life are chiral molecules. They have isomers with mirror images. Right and left-handed forms of these molecules will be formed in any natural reaction that will produce these molecules, including proteins and DNA. Proteins, the amino acids that make up proteins, and er the amino acids that make up proteins in every protein on Earth only exist in one form, the left-handed form, or what we call the levorotatory form. However, in any natural mixture of amino acids, both forms will exist. The ribose, the sugar that is also used in DNA, only exists in the dextrorotatory form, or the right-handed form, in both DNA and RNA. Well, natural scientists have offered numerous suggestions over the years as to how a pool of such molecules could be produced naturally uh, that would, again, favor one form or, over another. How do you get a pool of just left-handed amino acids to form? This is a big mystery. Theories have often focused on charged surfaces like clays or crystals, but with the problem of the oxygen atmosphere previously mentioned, most of the focus has become a search for the origin of life off-world. They're now looking for an origin of life solution off planet Earth. The origin of life, uh, termed, it, termed astrobiology or exobiology, has become NASA's main focus today. That's why they're looking for water on astronomical bodies or amino acids on asteroids. Uh, this was a, a, a recent report that came out stating that there were four times uh, m uh, more, they, they found m four times more left-handed amino acids on some asteroid than the right-handed form. But proteins don't just have more left-handed amino acids. They have all left-handed amino acids. And to date, they have not been able to come up with a scenario where only left-handed amino acids will form in any conceivable circumstance. But as try as they might, they still, uh, they still hope. Well, another major problem with the Miller-Urey experiment <clears throat> was that they obtained no chains or polymers of amino acids. M because amino acids react more readily with other molecules than amino acids, assembling a chain of amino acids is highly unlikely under natural conditions. But that's what proteins are. Proteins are chains of amino acids. More than that, they, those chain, uh, the original chain of amino acid has to be folded and is folded into a, a, at least two different forms, like the beta pleated sheet or the alpha helices that you show here on this diagram. Those secondary structures, like the beta pleated sheet or the alpha helices, are, are used to make up what we call a tertiary structure of proteins, which are just subunits of proteins. You first make the chain of amino acid, you have to then fold up this chain of amino acid just to make a subunit of a protein. And most proteins are massive, have hundreds of subunits. This one protein right here, which is a very important protein called the ATP synthase, has 500 protein subunits. This one protein, every, every one of those little spheres that makes up this model that you see there is an individual protein subunit. Well, to add some further rate to, weight to this argument, I want to calculate for you some probabilities. The probability of getting a small chain of amino acids to form under purely natural conditions. Okay, to do this, though, I want, we want to see how probabilities are calculated first. Um, we calculate the chance of getting, for example, uh, multiple heads every time we flip, flip a coin using the formula you see there, one and two to the second power, where... Uh, two represents how many possibilities there are, and N, you raise it to the power of how many heads you want to get in a row. So if you want to get two heads in a row, it's 
two to the second power, right? Two times two. If you want to get three heads in a row, you have to multiply two times two times two, and you get one out of eight. If you want to get eight heads in a row, it's two times two times two times two times. Do it eight times, you get 256. And you can see that the numbers get really big, really fast. You get 100 heads in a row, that's one out of two to the 100th power, or one out of 10 to the 30th power to get 100 heads in a row. This is, this is how probabilities are calculated. So let's calculate the chance of getting a small protein, a protein which only 150 amino acids. And to be honest, I cannot think of a protein that's that short, uh, except maybe for some basic labeling protein. Any your enzymatic proteins are much, much larger on the order of thousands of amino acids. Okay, so, well, so let's just calculate this probability. Okay, to do this, we need to know a few things. One, um, there, is, there are two different bonds that could link amino acids together, but only one bond is used to link amino acids together, but there's two possible bonds, so that's one calculation we have to add. Okay, if we want 150 amino acids that are only connected together by peptide bonds, that's the probability. One and two to the 150th power, or one and 10 to the 45th. Okay, we also want only left-handed amino acids, but again, in any natural pool of amino acids, they're going to have two types, and we only want the left-handed type we want 150 amino acids with only left-handed type and only uh, peptide bonds, so we'd have to multiply both, both of those together. But we want, also want a correct sequence of amino acids. We don't just want a random sequence. We need a functional protein. And to have a functional protein, we need a specific sequence of amino acids, okay? Um, so there are 20 amino acids used to make proteins, so we'd have to add that number, 20 to the 150th power, because there's 20 different amino acids. But I need to reduce that number for you because there are many amino acids that are very chemically similar to one another, and they can be substituted in proteins without affecting protein function. So I'm going to reduce this number by those amino acids, those that can be substituted for one another. I need to reduce this, give a tolerance adjustment on this, bringing that from 1 in 10 to the 195th power to 1 in 10 to the 74th power to adjust for those amino acids that can be substituted, okay? But anyway, I'd have to get this, to calculate the probability, I have to multiply those three numbers together to get just peptide bonds, to get just left-handed amino acids, and to get a correct sequence of amino acids and get a functional protein, I gotta multiply those three together, and when I do that, I get this number. The probability of building a functional protein by chance alone is one in 10 to the 164th power. That's a trillion, 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 trillion times smaller than the odds of finding a single specific particle amongst all the particles of the known universe. The law of probability states that the occurrence of any event where the chance is beyond 1 in 10 to the 50th, a much smaller figure than we're dealing with here, is an event that we can state with certainty will never happen. No matter how much time is allotted, no matter how many conceivable opportunities could exist for the event to take place, it's not possible based on the law of probability. Also note that many proteins, like I said before, like enzymes, are much, much larger. One single filament of the flagellum, one single filament of the flagellum may comprise as many as 30,000 protein subunits, which are each 300 amino acids long. One filament of a flagellum has as many as 30,000 subunits, each with 300 amino acids. And again, I want to remind that the cells possessing this structure, the flagellum, um, which have historically been viewed as the simplest life forms on Earth, were the very organisms that received the taxonomic name Monaran from Ernst Haeckel, who fraudulently described those first cells as simple little lumps of mucus or slime. And they actually are in possession. The bacteria are actually in possession. The most complex molecular machine we know of. Well, Francis Crick, again, one of the co-discoverers of the structure of DNA, was honest enough about the probability of spontaneous protein formation to admit that it was not possible. He said, if a particular amino acid sequence was selected by chance, how rare an event would this be? He says, the great majority of sequences can never have been synthesized at all at any time. Okay, so evolutionists have to explain the origin of genetic information. They have to explain the origin of proteins. But wait, there's more. 
It's not just the existence of information and proteins they have to explain. Uh, they also need to explain the, <coughs> the existence of the system through which genetic information is used to make proteins, the, system, uh, the process we call gene expression. They have to explain how this system came about. And to understand this, I'm going to have to explain to you a little bit how this works in simple terms. So let me explain. Well, uh, genes, chromosomes are, are made up of many genes. A gene is, uh, you can view a gene as like a sentence of instruction on this long strand we call a chromosome. Okay, well, genes are coded instructions for making proteins, as already, described, as already stated, and it does this in a two-step process called transcription and translation. In transcription, the cell makes a copy of the gene and then sends that copy out of the nucleus to an organelle called a ribosome that reads the code and makes a protein from it. Well, the ribosome that assembles the protein by this translation process translates the genetic code three nucleotides at a time. And it's a process called translation. It's translating the code. So these little mini coding units are called codons. And these codons instruct the ribosome on the amino acids to use when making a protein. For example, UGC is the code for cysteine. CUG is the code for leucine. ACU is the code for serine. When these codes are found in the genetic sequence, the ribosome will insert those amino acids when making the growing protein chain. Mm, by the way, the protein that I show you there is the protein hemoglobin. Uh, that's the protein in red blood cells that binds to oxygen and delivers it out to your cells. And just so you know, there's 270 million hemoglobin in every single red blood cell. Every single red blood cell. Well, there are numerous difficulties for origin of life theories in explaining the association between the genetic code and the proteins they produce. One of these difficulties involves this molecule called the transfer RNA, whose job is to deliver amino acids to the ribosome where they will become part of the assembled protein. Well, the problem lies in the fact that the amino acid being carried is bound on the opposite end of the molecule from where the genetic code is found. The amino acid is all the way on one end, but the genetic code that the amino acid, that the transfer RNA has that needs to match the genetic code is on the opposite end of the molecule. There's no connection between the amino acid and the code. Never has been. There's no, scientists can at this point not state why that code codes for this specific amino acid. They're never in direct contact, contact with one another. So how did the coding system come into being? It's at this point a complete mystery why those codes specify the amino acids they do. The code and the amino acid are never in contact with one another, ever. Well, the whole process of gene expression is now recognized to be so overwhelmingly complex that only a person completely blinded by their worldview could see, could not see the evidence of intelligent design that we find there. How did the coding system come into being? DNA is required to make protein, which again, proteins are the, serve as the army and machineries that make all the basic substances required for life. So protein is also required to make DNA. Protein is required to make protein. DNA is required to make DNA. ATP is required to make ATP. Due to such difficulties, origin of life theories include both DNA first, the first thing that evolved was DNA. Some argue that the first thing that evolved was a protein. And more recently, they, they argue the first thing that was evolved was RNAs. Well, the protein shown here is the is the protein called RNA polymerase. This is the enzyme that actually tr does the initial transcription step in gene expression. It's what copies the DNA, and that copy is then sent out of the nucleus. Well, this one protein has 3,000 amino acids. And remember, the probability of getting a protein to form that only has 150 amino acids was 1 in 10 to the 164th power. And this super important enzyme right here you can't make proteins without this enzyme, has 3,000 amino acids. Well, Stephen Meyer discusses the enigma of gene expression in his book, Signature in the Cell. He says, to build RNA polymerase, for example, the cell must first transcribe the genetic text with the instructions for building RNA polymerase. 
Yet to transcribe this information requires RNA polymerase and all the other associated enzymes and protein cofactors of, the tr of transcription stored in the DNA template. But expressing that information on, on the DNA template for building the proteins of the transcription system requires most of the proteins of the transcription system. Well, Sir Karl Popper, shown here, is best known for a contribution that he made to the scientific method called Popperian falsification. He argued that a scientist can't prove something to be true necessarily. They can just fall. They can't prove your theory true. You can, but you can falsify it with experimentation. And he argued that you should. Every scientist should attempt to falsify their own theory. And uh, so it's, it's a part of the scientific method now, what's referred to as Popperian falsification. Well, Popper asserted that... Uh, <coughs> he, anyway, he, uh, Popperian falsification uh, over, uh, ultimately went on to challenge certain important theories like string theory and multiverse theory, which can't be scientifically tested. He said you, you can't test them, you can't falsify them, you can't claim them to be valid theories either. Well, he said this uh, about the origin of the genetic code, pa Karl Popper. He said, what makes the origin of life and the genetic code a disturbing riddle is this. The genetic code is without any biological function unless it's translated, that is, unless it leads to the synthesis of the proteins whose structure is laid down by the code. But the machinery by which the, the cell translates the code consists of at least 50 macromolecular components which are themselves coded in the DNA. Thus, the code cannot be translated except by certain products of its translation. This constitutes, he says, a baffling circle, a really vicious circle, it seems, for any attempt to form a model or theory of the genesis of the genetic code. Thus, he says, we may be faced with the possibility that the origin of life, like the origin of physics, becomes an impenetrable barrier to science and a residue to all attempts to reduce biology to chemistry and physics. Because that's what they do. They try to reduce biology. They try to reduce life to being nothing more than chemical and physical processes, laws, scientific laws, and chance processes. Well, the simplest cell we know of is this cell. It's called mycoplasm genitalium. This is the red, that you, pink that you see there. It is a parasitic bacteria that inhabits the human urinary tract. Well, by deleting genes from the mycoplasm genome, researchers were able to reduce its required number of genes down to 256. Okay, but it should be noted again that this is a parasitic bacteria and can live with fewer, fewer genes, can live with fewer proteins because it utilizes the products of an existing living cell. It's a parasite. It, can, it cannot live outside of a host. This organism cannot. <clears throat> well, this simple of cells requires at least 250 genes to live, assuming then a minimum of 250 proteins that form spontaneously. If they only had 150 amino acids in length, the probability of each one of those would be 1 out of the 10 to the 164th power. So we'd have to, to, to get this cell going with just proteins, we'd have to multiply the 250 necessary proteins by 10 to the 164th power to determine the probability of getting the simplest cell we know of to form through purely natural processes, and we get this probability. One out of the 10 to the 41,000th power. And that's just to explain the origin of 250 pro very small proteins. Not the nucleic acids, not the DNA, not the carbohydrates, not the lipids, just one of the macromolecules required by life. Robert Gange is a research scientist with extensive research in the field of uh, information systems. He said, the likelihood of life having occurred through a chemical accident is for all intents and purposes zero. Indeed, the law of probability states that the occurrence of any event where the chance is beyond one in 10 to 50th power is uh, just not possible, no matter how much time is allowed. Joe McFadden is an evolutionist and professor of molecular biology and quantum physics. He states in his book, Quantum Evolution, the simplest living cell could not have arisen by chance. 
Just like the eye, the protocell must have evolved from simpler ancestral cells, presumably by a process of natural selection. But this is where the first big problem with the origin of life arises. What were these simpler entities? Of course, Ernst Haeckel tried to invent them, but uh, they've never been found. They don't exist. They've never existed. The fact is that life is more than just a batch of chemicals. You, we know everything that life requires now. We can put all of that into a test tube. We can put all the nucleic acids and all the proteins and the lipids and the carbohydrates. We can put every single enzyme that they need into a test tube. And you still cannot reconstitute life. There's more to life than just a bunch of molecules. Well, Francis Crick, again, the co-discoverer of the DNA helix, reasoned that life could not have evolved from non-living chemicals under any conceivable conditions on earth. He said, an honest man, armed with all the knowledge available to us now, could only state that in some sense, the origin of life appears at the moment to be almost a miracle. So many are the conditions which would have had to have been satisfied to get it going. But the idea of a creator was unacceptable to Francis Crick, since it would go against his atheistic faith. Therefore, he proposed in his book, Life Itself, that primordial life came to earth from space. Some believe that life might have arrived being carried by an asteroid known as panspermia. However, Francis Crick believes that it was shipped to earth billions of years ago by spaceships by supposedly more evolved and therefore more advanced alien beings. Paul warned us in, in 2 Timothy that the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside the myths. Ladies and gentlemen, do not be led away by these false teachings of evolutionists. We did not evolve by natural processes, but rather we were the very purpose of the creation, made by our loving Father in heaven to have fellowship with him in both this life and the everlasting life to come. Let me close this out in a word of prayer. Father God, we uh, humble ourselves before you as your servants, Lord God, as, our, as your slaves, Father God. <sighs> Humbling ourselves before you, Father, uh, asking for your help. Lord God, we need you. We live in a world of misinformation, Father God. We need your insight and wisdom. We live in a world that saturates us with bad behaviors and sin, Father God. We need you. Father God, send your Holy Spirit to us, Lord, and... Uh, Give us wisdom and insight about the science. Help us to understand the, the, the science, Lord, so we can be an effective witness for you. And convict us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, Lord. Examine us. And if there be sin in our lives, Lord God, convict us. Send your Holy Spirit to convict us, Lord, we ask. Help us, Lord, to clean our lives of the sins that may be there. Give us, give us wisdom and insight, Father, we ask, to help us be effective witnesses for you, Lord God. And then, Lord God, give us boldness, Lord, we ask. Give us boldness to speak when the opportunity presents itself. Help us, Lord, to speak and testify about the truths of your creation, Lord God. Help us to speak in, about the truths of your Son, Yeshua, the Messiah, who died for our sins so that we could be forgiven. Give us boldness, Lord, we ask. Help us, Lord, so we are not timid, so that we do not shrink back from the science, that we stand with boldness, declaring uh, the truth of creation to all that will hear. Father God, help us to be bold as a witness, Lord, we ask. Praise you, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for the insight and wisdom we have gained from it, Lord, and we ask that you help us to share that with the world around us. Praise you, Lord God. We praise your holy name. We thank you, Lord God, for everything you've done for us, for sending your word to us, for sending your son to die for us. Thank you, Lord God.